Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tublas Creek Instagram Live uh, broadcast. Um, I am Jason Haas, as always. Um, my guests this week are Alicia Moore and Allison Thompson from Two Wolves Wine. I cannot wait for you to meet them and to hear about what they are working on. But as I always do, while we're waiting for people to join, I wanted to share a few pictures of what's going on here at the vineyard. Um, so the main thing that's going on is that we are getting kind of the, the winter's growth under control. That includes mowing, it includes crimping, it includes going through and trying to get the weeds and the vetch out from underneath where the grapevine rows are. You can see here where we've gone through with our tornasol attachment and um, gotten rid of the weeds in amongst the vines. It's a particular challenge this year because the cover crop has been so exuberant, the vetch is everywhere. So it's crawling and climbing up into the vines and we've got to go through and, and, and get that under control. Um, we are also, so the right time of year to do some grafting. So we have a couple of blocks from varieties that either um, aren't really relevant for us what we're doing. There's some of the original Pinot vines, Pinot Noir vines that we had here to produce budwood for the Haas vineyard that my dad planted back 15 years ago. We also have some Petit Malsang that we decided was just not super well suited to this climate. So we've grafted those over to Viognier. You can see the Viognier buds in here. So we're now um, starting to see a little bit of growth there. Um, it is, oh, <laughs> I'll just show you a picture. You were wondering like how the vetch on the cover crop is doing. This is a Tanat vine that is getting an enormous vetch hug. Um, and so all of these have to be, be cleaned out individually, um, which is always a, um, always, always a lot of handwork. Um, did want to show you kind of the, the overview of how things look in the areas where um, we have not yet um, not yet gone through and knocked down the cover crop. This is a uh, head train dry farmed um, no till block of Kunwas in the foreground. And then you can see in the background where the hillside has um, has uh, started to go under control. But overall, things are looking great. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, one last thing. Um, we have been doing some bottling over the last couple of weeks. So we got the Patelin Blanc um, into bottle. That's great. We're excited to have this out in the market. Um, we also got boxes done. Um, look for a story about that on the blog coming up. We, uh, we, we're using um, a partner to do the box filling, and we think that that is a huge, um, going to be a huge asset for us in the long run. Okay, that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I am going to invite the folks from Two Wolves to join us. In there, and hopefully um, this will work as it does when everything works. Um, so the thing about technology is that you, hey, it did work. It worked. I was so nervous because I told you I knew how to do it. And then I was like, do I know how to do this? Oh, man. And um, even if you do absolutely know how to do it, I find that there's still about a 10% chance that it doesn't work for no reason why you can figure out. Um, it's terrifying. And I think I swallowed a magnet as a child. So you can ask Allison. <laughs> everything around me breaks. <laughs> She's not that bad. Uh, uh, Hi. Yeah, I had a how are you both? Hello, Alicia. Hello, Allison. Um, thank, you for, thank you for joining. Thanks for having us. You know we love you and everything that you do. So, uh, Awesome. Well, the admiration is, is definitely mutual. So um, I, I like to start by asking people to share their kind of path into wine. Like, did, uh, was wine something that you had on your family tables growing up? Was it uh, mm -hmm. something you came to later? And how did that happen? Well, um, my dad drank Lowenbrau, so no. Um, <laughs> and my mom would put a little Manischewitz on the Hanukkah table, which was awful. No offense to Manischewitz. Please don't sue me. Um, <laughs> I hear no, better now. Honestly, my mom, I went to Chateauneuf du Pop once and sent her a bottle of wine, and she said, it tastes like just like the stuff in the grocery store. I was like, cork it and send it back, <laughs> you ungrateful woman. Um, no, it, it sort of, I fell down a rabbit hole in my 20s from traveling because I'm lucky enough to get to travel with my, my first dream. And 
Really, it's as simple as when you only know, like people are like, how's Bucharest? I'm like, well, the, the gym was good and the venue was dark. <laughs> you know, when, when you have days off, you just want to be in nature. You want to be outside. You want to be in the sun. And, and me and my crew would just start going and visiting vineyards on days off. And we all kind of just fell in love with farmers and winemakers and wine growers. And I just became absolutely obsessed. It became something that I wanted to pursue. I'm a high school dropout, so this was the first time that I really felt like a student. Um, I started taking online courses on tour. I would literally say, good night, Sydney, and go back and set my glasses up and get my computer out and start my tasting. And, um, I just loved it. And then when we moved to this property in 2013, I inherited 18 already certified organic acres of beautiful grapes. I had no idea what I was doing and I just, I'm a person that needs to see things. I can't really read. I need to, I'm tactile. I need to roll up my sleeves and get into it. So I really wanted to work with women. Um, and so I just start, I got on my hands and knees and started learning in January. I want to learn everything that you do in a vineyard for, right. for 24 months. I want to immerse myself. We started making wine in our garage and I just started asking around, like, do you know any up and coming or what hungry, like good, good, do you know a good person that happens to be a female that wants to help me do this? And I met Allison and, and Allison's story is way more interesting than mine. <laughs> um, and it just so happened that we have two kids that are exactly the same age that love each other. E well, we each have two kids. Yeah. <laughs> and not, not together. But also she's the hardest working person I've ever met. And, and she's also so incredibly brilliant about plants. And so it's been a wonderful relationship because I didn't know the rules coming into this. We just got through our 10th harvest together and I don't know any rules. And that's kind of fun when you don't know the rules because, and you don't even know math. And you're like, well, why can't we? And she's like, cause science. I'm like, <laughs> But why can't we do that? She's like, because math. I'm like, okay, well, this is boring. <laughs> Damn it, science. Um, like, wait, you're always getting in the way. Yeah, I know. So but then sometimes I'm like, yes, this is, that's a great idea. Let's try that. Yeah. And we're like, you know. And you need so, both. You need, you need somebody who's, who's the idea generator. You need somebody right. who's also the, the person who says, well, that's amazing and that's amazing and that's amazing and that's amazing. But we can't do all four of those things. Like, yeah. let, let, like let's pick two. So, Allison, can you share a little of your story? Sure. Allison's um, a badass, number one. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up in Northern California. And, Come here. Don't okay, be afraid of me. Okay. Just like yeah. be on camera. Yeah. Um, and in the Bay Area around and, and loved cooking and gardening and food. And um, my parents were a bit into wine and, you know, had a little collection going from Napa. We had a little cabin just north of Napa, so we'd drive through and pick up a couple bottles on our way. And um, so it, w it was definitely something that was, you know, part of my growing up. And um, I went to college for uh, biology. I studied uh, ecology in a couple of years, but also started working in a tasting room with a couple friends up in San Inez Valley and really loved learning about wine and, and loved the idea that I could combine a bunch of my interests into one, you know, job and one passion. And, um, and so I worked in, I lived mm -hmm. in Italy and got to taste a lot of wines there and learn about Italian wines and, and felt really passionate about that experience and wanted to go back. And um, I, I went to grad school for winemaking and, and that was just, I so sort of rolled the dice. I hadn't actually worked in production yet, um, but really wanted to go back to, you know, do a bit more school. And um, so I went to UC Davis and studied viticulture uh, under David Smart. And, <laughs> and uh, it was an incredible learning experience. And in that time, I also was able to do an internship in Barolo, um, where I worked for Sergio Germano of Ettore Germano. And, um, and it was incredible. It was crazy hard work and um, came back 
so inspired and really excited to to work in the industry and um was coming back down to santa barbara and and started working for what first i worked at sniquanon i did a harvest there and then i worked for steve clifton at palmina for several years and then um chad melville uh at his side project samsara um and that's that's it. how we met that's how we met chad sort of i was worried when i first moved here that people would think the circus was coming to town you know, the whole celebrity wine thing is not at all what I, if I could have released the wines anonymously, I would have. Um, Cause I really wanted, I take this very seriously and I wanted the integrity to be intact. And um, Chad kind of threw open his doors for me. He was such a mentor for me and everyone around here actually um, just threw open their doors. You want a barrel taste, you want to learn about clones, you want to see what we're doing, just come on through. And it wasn't a pink thing. It was a, this is a young girl that really, really wants to learn. And, you know, let's give her a shot. So I would say that that's what's awesome about where we live in this region that people don't know a whole lot about is that people are just hardworking farmers and wine growers here. And it's a community of people that support each other and know each other. And it's, it's really beautiful. And so Chad said, yeah, I, I know this, you know, my, my assistant winemaker is amazing. Come to dinner. I'll invite her and I won't tell her anything, but Allison met me at dinner and she just thought I was the most inquisitive person she'd ever met. <laughs> just a lot of questions. <laughs> I was like, so tell me again about Barolo. And um, <laughs> I was like 2020 <laughs> and we just started working together and it's been, it's been, amazing and hard and beautiful and we've put really all of our love into the vineyard that's been my thing since the beginning is is what is the potential here and what is the magic and how do we how do we stay out of the way but but get in where we fit in mm -hmm. and yep. i'm really proud of the wines that we make i'm really really proud of the wines that we make and i think we do a kick-ass job and I think we're good stewards and it's been a wild ride. A slow, it's been slow on purpose. Yeah. I mean, there, we had five harvests and Allison was like, we are out of room. We should put some wine out. I was like, no, nah, we don't have to. It was, it was like, we, our, first, our first release was 75 cases, but I was like, this is, this is good. We need to actually sell some wine at some point because we can't just keep stacking it up. Yeah, and no, it, that's rock. At some point, at some point, it, it is a, a like very expensive decoration, yeah. and you run. <laughs> so I love that you talked about the the kind of community that that builds up in wine regions, and I think people really do recognize kindred spirits. Like they they do open their doors, and that's true in Santa Barbara County. It's true in Paso. It's true from what I what I see in Sonoma, Napa. Um, I'm curious, like when you. So Alicia, when you decided to move to wine country, did you move to wine country knowing that you wanted to make wine or did you move to wine country for the quality of life and the beauty and then have this vineyard and decide to go at it that way? What was the, what was the motivation? I, I, wanted to, I wanted to make wine. I wanted to, even if I just did it in my garage in Carboys, I wanted to, I wanted to make wine. I was so inspired by the people that I've met in the world. And I just wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to see what it was like. And it was really in my studies that I kind of started. It was a whole life switch for me. And it was, it was just learning about tasting, right? And in, in school, they tell you to go to a farmer's market and get every kind of produce that you can get your hands on and then taste taste the difference and learn how to talk about it because there's all these words for, for all of the senses, but except smell and, and taste it, there's not a lot of, it's, it's, a, it's a craft that you have to learn how to do. Um, and so just le learning about the different kinds of tomatoes and different kinds of mushrooms and how would I, how would I verbally express the difference between a lemon and a lime? It's not something you think about in everyday life. And it sort of makes you slow down and pay attention. And then when you're dealing with nature and wine growing is a hundred percent about weather and nature and, and being flexible mm -hmm. and, and rolling with the, yeah. 
curveballs that get thrown at you. It's <laughs> it's wild and it's exciting and it's so I I moved here because I wanted to make wine. I didn't know how. I didn't know what. That was I think a fun thing for Allison when we yeah. first met was there was no program. There was no idea. There was just there's different blocks here. There's different grapes. I want to keep them all separate. If we bottle them, I want to bottle them separately. I want to learn about each block and each grape. I don't want to do a blend. I remember Matt Dees was it from Honada was in one of our first tasting groups and he was like, please just make one wine. Trust me. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to make one wine. You make like 23 wines, bro. He's like, trust me, make one wine. I was like, I don't want to. So we really do single bottle varietals still to this day. We only do one blend. And that's because what's fascinating to me is learning about a place and how that grape expresses itself in that place. And so our Cab Franc is usually 100% Cab Franc, if not 97%. Our Petit Bordeaux, 100% Petit Bordeaux. Our Syrah is a field blend with Malvasia, just because Viognier is exciting, but I think Malvasia is so much moodier and more interesting and why, and just, it ferments at this, or sorry, it, it um, it grows at the same time and is ready to be harvested at the same time. So it's a perfect field blend. Our Graciano is 100% Graciano carbonic. It's just semion, like it's it's really, and it's fun too. I'm sorry, I'm a talker. You can shut me up at any point. <laughs> but it's like, it's my love. But it's really fun too because for me, you know, people are like, well, you're a celebrity. I would keep that hush hush and make sure pink is very separate from two wolves. But what's actually become really fun is that people that love me for what I do in my other thing are now first time wine buyers. I, and I, I'm I, taking them on that journey with me because I love it and it's a rabbit hole and it's the more you know, the less you know. And it's fun for them too to come along with me and be like, cool, what, if, what are you doing right now? Why do you have a fist in between two <laughs> shoots? And I'm like, oh, good question. Okay, let's talk <laughs> about pruning. So the whole thing has been really, really fun. and. It also happens to be really fun that I feel like this person is my sister and our kids feel like cousins and it's, it's really the dream. Awesome. Um, can you talk about where you got the name for Two Wolves from? Sure. I am obsessed with the parable, the Two Wolves parable, which is, um, I believe it's a Cherokee legend, but I've heard that it has many different origins. Um, but it's basically a grandfather is talking to his grandson or a grandmother is talking to her granddaughter. And, and she says that there are two wolves inside of each of us. And one is greed and envy and jealousy and anger and hatred and judgment. And the other wolf is, um, love, love and curiosity and acceptance and generosity. And the, the granddaughter thinks about it for a second and says, well, which one wins? And the grandmother says, the one you feed. And I've always loved that because I'm a big believer in balance in life. And I've lived a very out of balance life at times. I've lived a very crazy life. And balance is what I seek. And I have also found that that is true in, in the vineyard, in, in soil, in the bottle, um, in friendships, in relationships, and um in how you treat yourself so it's just all wrapped up into one and you know there's two of us <laughs> i mean uh, an estate vineyard is a is a complicated organism i mean there are obviously there's the grape growing side of things there's a wine making side of things there's a business side of things um and i'm curious as to like how you the two of you divide up the, the pieces of that and if there are things that like you particularly love to do and things you particularly dread to do I mean how, how does how does that work I can tell you I dread cleaning a press <laughs> you're really good at it though that doesn't mean I like it <laughs> why don't you take that one <laughs> um so we, I mean we're a small team it's it's Alicia and I and for many years it was really just the, the two of us and then um we have support on the, the financial, like business management side of it. Um, and we've slowly added a couple people to our team. 
uh, we have um, someone who handles all of our DTC sales. We have a, a seller master now, and um, we are five. We are five women wolves. Yeah, yeah, and so um, you know, we I, we do a lot of all of it, and because it is a small um, organization, and we have a vineyard management company that that deals with the day to day in the vineyard, and so they're able to provide all of the support on that side, including the labor part of it. But we typically have the same crew that works with us um, here and they've really gotten to know the vineyard over the last um, decade or more, um, which is really, has been really, really wonderful to work with them and, and um, our vineyard manager, Juve, who kind of specializes in this area. Um, so that, that part of it, you know, we interface with them a lot on all of the decisions, but they, they make the daily stuff happen. Um, and then, you know, on the sales and that side of things, like we're, you know, we kind of do a little bit of it all. It. <laughs> I, we, we are mostly DTC, which is fun because it's mostly, uh, just people that are, in, are curious and interested. And, um, one fun thing for me has been through travels is if I have a day off and there's an awesome restaurant that I've been curious about, I'll go and. That's sort of how we met Michaela, who, what do we call, what does she do? What do we call her? She's our, uh, <laughs> our, our brand manager, I okay. think is her official title. I met uh, her at Petite Crenn in San Francisco because I wanted to eat Dominique Crenn's food. And I, my husband asked me, all right, we have a day off in San Francisco. What do you, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't want to take the kids to a trampoline park. I don't want to go on a date with you. I just want to <laughs> take my book and go sit at the bar at Petite Crenn and I want to read my book and eat great food and be left alone. <laughs> and that's how I met Michaela because she walked up to me. She was like, you want to do the pairing? I was like, yes, I do. She goes, you want to go classic or weird? I was like, can we do both? <laughs> She's like, yep. I'm like, we just became best friends. And now she's our brand manager. So it's all been very, very, very slow and organic. Every restaurant we're in, we've I've gone to myself and that part's kind of fun because you walk in with a box of wine and they're looking at you like, Mm, okay, this will be fun. <laughs> and then by the end of it, they're like, huh, yeah, no, good. I like it. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> and one of the th things that coming into this, Alicia was like, we are never making more than 2,000 cases of wine. Um, because she had this vision that she wanted to be able to be involved in all of it and not let it get away to the point where it's like a lot of work. We do make more than 2,000 cases. Not a, not a lot more, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, we just we have too many good grapes. Want to, want to share it? It's yeah. hard not making enough to to be able to share it with the people you want to exactly. share it with. It's exactly you need enough to be able to share it. Um, when you go on tour and then you get home on a Friday, and Saturday morning at five o'clock harvest starts, <laughs> you question all of your life all choices. <laughs> <laughs> That was actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask because, I mean, it's not like you don't have a fully involved and exhausting uh, career already. Um, and winemaking is a of year where it is really that like, you've got to be in there. And it's very physical also. Like, um, is that, like, how, are there pieces of the, of the making calendar or the grape growing calendar that you want to make you're always there for that you kind of schedule tours and other things that will take you on the road around never booked a tour during harvest the last couple of years um last year yeah last year i took off from august 15th to september 15th so that i'd at least be able to kick off harvest um and then we didn't, the, our first pick was like September 17th or something. <laughs> I just sat there like, are you kidding me? That's We're at 17 bricks? Like what? Yeah. Okay, well, bye. Yeah. Um, but blend I've together. been here We're for all of it. We're blending right now. We're blending. Um, so, uh, again, I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I lost you in the middle of um, you talking about how you essentially the things you choose to make sure that you're a part oh, yeah. of um, the
the fact that last year you had these best laid plans of uh, being around to kick off harvest and then harvest was like a month late yeah um, yeah that's the that's the challenge of course because we're not we're working all of us with a natural process and a natural phenomenon that uh is not entirely under our control no that's kind of the beauty of it um not last year but uh yeah yeah, we, throughout the year, I mean, I live here, so that's beautiful. Any, any day that I'm home, I'm here. And so, and Allison basically lives here, too. <laughs> but we're it's always, place. we're always blending. We're always, we're, we're always checking barrels. We're, I'm always off for harvest. Um, you do your printing. I do my printing, because it's my favorite thing in the whole world. And... Oh, and and I'm sure you can tell that I write all of the tasting notes. She if you've ever read them. <laughs> There's the newsletters and the tasting notes and all the stuff on the website. Allison that. asked me not to put the Kraft Mac and Cheese note in there, but she made it. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I want to talk a little bit about farming. Um, you said that when you when you bought the property, it was already organically farmed. Um, to, to what extent, like, was the farming side of things and the viticulture side of things something that you had anticipated? And to what extent was it something that, like, you got there, like, oh, I better figure all this out. And then it obviously becomes this thing that is, like, you can dive in as deep as you want. I think for me, farming was it from the beginning. It was the thing that I was most interested in learning about and being a part of. It was more interesting to me than even chemistry or or how does fermentation work because that's the whole beauty about all of it is is working alongside Mother Nature and and learning about roots and clones and, and how the different I mean how, the difference between Cab Franc here and Cab Franc in France and the different regions in France and what is our region? What are we, you know, what are we doing? And it's been the most fascinating experience. And I think that's because of how we started, we kept everything so separate. So to be able to watch Petit Verdot ferment and be a, a grape that you grew and watched grow and really are starting to understand and how does this ferment look different than this ferment? How are these, like our Grenache clusters are huge. How is this different than, than our Cabernet clusters? And how are the different cab blocks? It's just all, it's all so fascinating. And it doesn't hurt that I'm sitting next to a plant scientist, geek, that's amazing and has all of the answers. Like, is it okay that I'm eating this weed? Cause it's really tasty. Is this gonna kill me? She's like, no, that's personally, and that's delicious. You can put it in a salad. I'm like, and now it's my favorite thing in the whole world. The whole thing, it's, it's, it's hard to explain to people. Like that's why I always encourage people like get out in a vineyard, go to a wine region, get, take your shoes off, walk through the dirt. It's just, it's endlessly fascinating. And even on this like little plot of land, like the different things that Alicia did and that we did more of something like was um, soil pits to understand what was happening in this vineyard underground. And because you can make all these assumptions, but it's really big now that you don't really know. And um, and you know, it's such a diverse soil type area right here because we have hillsides. Um, I don't know. Is that our sound or yours? No, that's our sound. We have uh, we have uh, jets from usually from Lemoore oh. who decide that they want to do oh. like dog fighting practice oh. over our vineyard in the middle of the day. It's like uh, once every ten or fifteen of these lies. I'm like, oh great, like yeah. that's the date. Well, here I'm surprised you're not hearing motocross happening behind me yeah, because right that would be, would be my husband. Yeah. Um, I am, what I'm hearing on your end is so many birds, oh, yeah. which is like, I, I absolutely love it. I, I mean, I think that's the, that's one of the best. Things. If it, if the internet doesn't go out, I don't want to go too far from the building. <laughs> this is our winery here. 
Cool. And on that hillside, that's where the Grenache starts over there. I don't know. Uh -huh. Cool. And then it goes all, all the way down there. It's absolutely beautiful here. Lovely. Graciano and Syrah, and then up there is some Sauv Blanc. Yeah, it's really beautiful here. So what sorts of changes have you made in the farming? And that's our like... tractor. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm happy to know that it's not just our problems. Thank you for contributing a problem or two. That's uh, it's very much appreciated. Oh, I'm always good better. for contributing a problem or two. Right? Oh, I have a solution. Always, always up for the solution. Um, yeah. So I would love to. I know. I know we've talked a little bit um, about regenerative farming, and I know you came out here and and spent a little bit of time with Neil and Chelsea talking about that. I'm curious as to and your dogs, uh, your beautiful, beautiful dogs. Dog. I don't even know where my dog is at the moment. She was wandering around earlier, probably in the background. Um, I was curious, like, what pieces of that are you implementing? Or are you excited to implement? Where Where are you in the sort of regenerative farming um, I don't know, movement? Isn't quite with the word that I'm looking for, but like the the implementation. It's definitely a conversation that we have. I'm sort of still in the what. What exactly is regenerative farming state? Because I've studied biodynamics and um, visited a lot of biodynamic farmers and read Steiner and all the things. Um, so I'm still trying to, what's interesting too is whether you, you want to be 100% of something so that you can be certified for something or if you want to lean towards certain practices and what you're right. interested in. In the conversations that I've had with Allison, it sounds like from what we're doing, we are immersed in regenerative farming. We don't have animals yet, right? But other than beneficial and many non-beneficial pests. <laughs> um, do you want to talk yeah. about, more about that? I mean, so it, the whole regenerative movement to me is really interesting because when I was at UC Davis, my lab, it's kind of what we did before there was like a word for it and before it was something that people were talking about. But my lab really studied um, carbon sequestration in soils. And, and so things like does cover cropping in a vineyard, perennial cover cropping versus um, annual cover cropping versus no cover crop or tilled systems, like how does it affect soil carbon and, and grassland systems where there range management and grazing, how that affects um, soil carbon and, um, and you know, and so now that now it's a thing, you know, which I, I think is so fascinating because it felt like when I was there, nobody was really besides scientists were really interested in this idea that that agriculture can contribute such a huge amount of right. carbon into the atmosphere and that we really can take some of these management practices and implement them in a way that um, can sequester carbon and, and help benefit the soils and um, benefit and therefore benefit the plants. And so, um, you know, some of the stuff that we do, um, lots of vineyards do, but, you know, we, we are very um, into our cover crop and have experimented with what kind of cover crop we're using every year. Um, we use, uh, we have insectary rows, which, um, don't get mowed down. And so, you know, we're in a very arid climate here in Happy Canyon. Um, our average rainfall is about 14 inches every year. And so, um, you know, no-till systems, um, I think, are, are really beneficial, but also maybe not practical in, in some place like where some of our hillsides, we have like that much topsoil, you know, and um, and so, you know, we use a lot of um, cover cropping. We do try and limit our tilling practices. Um, like Alicia said, we don't have animals yet, but it is part of the conversation. One, one day we'll 
um, delve into that. And, um, but I think in general, you know, having a perennial system and we plant um, native plants, hedgerows as well to, to attract uh, beneficial insects. So we're not having to spray as much and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it, you know, I, I've listened to a podcast talking about what you guys are doing and implementing in, in Tablas Creek. And um, I don't, I, I think that regenerative farming is something that we really do need to be talking about as an industry. And what, even those small practices that you can do that can reduce the amount of carbon um, that you're putting out into the atmosphere and, and sequestering. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love the way you talk about it as being kind of a continuum where there are, there's this whole family of regenerative practices. Mm -hmm. You don't, don't, I don't think people should feel like they have to do all of them in order for yeah. it to be a benefit. Like, I, um, the, for me, as, as, I've, as I've thought more about what regenerative farming really is, um, it feels like, like it's basically farming that kind of goes beyond on just like not being a part of the problem to try right. to figure out ways that farming can be a part of the solution to the big picture issues like resource scarcity, climate change, topsoil loss, mm -hmm. and even things that are more like business related things like inequality or animal welfare or farm worker rights. I mean, things like that. These all have a place in this regenerative, this regenerative sphere, but the idea that like the only right way to do it is to be like, okay, there's 73 things on this regenerative farming list and I've got to do all of them. Like, I think that's, first of all, it's paralyzing. Like that's yeah. not helpful. Second of all, it's not realistic. Like mm -hmm. you want people to be doing as many of those things as they can figure out a way to incorporate it to their goal to make a sustainable business that's successful and that makes a product that they can sell and, and all these things that need to happen in order for it to continue in a reasonable way. So I think, I think the way you're thinking about it is a really logical way to do it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we work with Steve Mathiasen and, and part of what he brings to it is making those small changes of like, what can we do? Yeah. Um, like those incremental changes that over time can make a difference, um, both for the vineyard health and, you know, environmentally what we can do. Um, okay. It, it has been, it has been half an hour. I really could talk with you both all afternoon. It would be a huge pleasure, but I have two questions that I want to ask. One of them, um, which like, I've got to, like, I've got to do a little bit of fan service for the, all of the people who've been lobbying in questions who want to know like how on earth they get to wolves wine. Um, so, and, and people asking from other countries, like what, what, how, what do you tell them people who are asking? Well, we do most of it online on our, through our website, which is twowolveswine.com. And there's sort of a tribe wait list going on. Um, cause we don't make very much wine. <laughs> we really don't. People think that like, I was some kind of giant producer. I was in charge of answering customer service emails for about a year until uh, Allison changed my password. I'm not allowed to talk to people anymore. Uh, I think I once told someone we're not gap. We're two moms. <laughs> Mother nature gave us what we got. Um, we're also in some restaurants and, uh, I've been working really hard while on tour, um, getting importers. So we have, have an importer in Belgium. We have an importer in France. We have an importer in the UK now and Australia. So that's like a big deal to me because yeah. it's, you know, I'm getting ready to play my Paris show and I'm having a full 12 <laughs> wine tasting in the morning. And I'm like, whew. This will wear off by the time I'm hanging upside down. Uh, no, it's been really fun. But it, again, we make, we don't make a lot of wine and, and we love getting it into people's hands and we love hearing from people. We, uh, we also distribute to New York, um, Tennessee and Montana. So if you're in those states, we, we have distributors. And, um, and yeah, just little by little, we, we, uh, are expanding and trying to get it.
um, it's worth it. It's worth it. We think it's worth it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so cool. Okay. And then um, last question, like, is there something that you're super excited about that you are going to be doing in the wine world or things that like a wine you have coming out that you're super excited about or something um, that you want to want to want to talk about as a future thing that you haven't done yet um, that uh, that you can share? All I can think about is our cement eggs and how they will not finish a ferment for the last two years. And so I'm really excited about possibly getting rid of them. <laughs> uh, makes you feel better. If it makes you feel better, our, our concrete eggs never finish fermenting either. Uh, seems like uh, maybe a maybe a like a structural flaw in concrete eggs if nobody can get them actually to finish fermenting. But yeah. okay, well, um, it's good to know. Ferment, good to like, know. Not Nine months later, ten months later, they're really good. Yeah, maybe we should just come back. <laughs> uh, we're replanting. <clears throat> yes, we are replanting. Uh, very excited about yeah. that. <laughs> Two varietals that I'm obsessed with. Uh, one, thanks to you guys, which is Vermentino and uh, Pecorino. I've become obsessed. Allison has been begging me to plant something. Italian <laughs> for a very very long time and she's finally we lost yeah. a we lost a four-year battle with um oh my god my mind just went blank mealybugs mealybugs I was about to say mealworms I'm like that's not right <laughs> yeah. we lost a four-year battle <laughs> with <laughs> <laughs> and we tried everything we tried peeling back the bark spraying with grain alcohol seduce you name it and it just started spreading into other areas so we gave up the fight and we pulled out two blocks and We've left the soil now for what? Has it been five, three, four, four five years? Yeah, it's been a while. So yeah, we're talking about planting some Vermentino and Pecorino, which I'm really, 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 really stupid excited about. <laughs> um, and as the vines get older, the wine changes and becomes more and more delicious. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, it's a really interesting, ride that we're on and our semion skin contact semion which is what we're tasting right now is god darn delicious <laughs> yeah. awesome well, well um thank you both so much alicia and allison thank you uh, so much excited to have you be a part of the central coast wine community um and uh, can't wait to see, can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks for uh, sticking through the uh, technical difficulties on, on my end. Oh, it happens all the time. I actually am feeling very pleased that it wasn't myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We adore you and we're gonna come visit you soon if that's okay. Sweet, anytime. Awesome. Okay. Thanks Bye, guys. Thanks. Thanks so much.